Hi, this is Dr. Goldcamp, and welcome back to the next episode of the Keto Naturopath on YouTube. I wanted to take a different turn today into some of the things I talk about. Certainly, it's about protein, but I want to go into the history of the protein sparing modified fast, history of the protein movement in general. Because if you're like me, when you hear this new idea and everybody's taken by it, I go, so who's been doing this before? Where did this get started? I did this about five years ago with a ketogenic diet. I needed for me to know the history and the evolution of the ketogenic diet. And therefore, when I would listen to current speakers, I'd find out, so what's the piece that they're doing that hasn't been done before? What's the new twist? Or, and I, and I mean this in a sincere way, what was the new part that they've done? You know, where, where did the ketogenic diet, how is it being applied differently than it was before? Etc. So right now, protein is certainly a big part of my life. This is how we eat. And I like to go back into history, certainly the medical history, and to find out where this came from. And it's very fascinating. You know, so much is not new at all. Really, the only things that are new are the technologies, right? So nobody had a, a glucometer up until maybe 10 or 20 years ago, a convenient one. Certainly nobody had a, a, a glucometer. Um, and so these are the little things that changed, but allow us to really tell the same story in a new version. But the concept is the same, and what people were doing is pretty much the same. It's unchanged. So let's take a deep dive into the history of the protein sparing modified fast. Okay. So, you know, it really started a long time ago. So if you're asking me, and this is my video, um, I'm going to tell you that it really started with this man in particular. Uh, he was an Arctic explorer. He was actually a Canadian, but really his parents were Finnish who came to Canada. And i um, not quite sure how to pronounce his name, but William or Stefansson. We'll call him William, <laughs> William Stefansson. And an uh, interesting little story is that he ended up coming to Dartmouth and I went to high school in Hanover area. And I would hear about this institute called the Corel Institute, Cold Regions Research. It had nothing to do with the college, and it was kind of to the north towards Lyme. And, you know, what did it do out there? It was Cold, Reason, Cold Regions Research. Well, it became, it was all the work of Vilhamar Stefansson and all his uh, Arctic explorations from 2008 up until the late 1920s. And it was a it was a uh, compendium of all his work, and obviously it was militarily sponsored because the idea was if we have to fight in the Arctic, we need to know about this. And so it ended up being Arctic um, expertise, Alpine expertise, how to fight in the Alps, how to fight in the Arctic, how to fight in Antarctica. And uh, interesting, but it started with this person. Okay. Um, he was, what happened, I'm going to paraphrase as we go through this, is that he went on a number of explorations and he became the explorer of the Arctic, which had to do with what is now this, uh, I was about to say Soviet Union, a part of Russia and the upper peninsula and certainly upper Alaska and far Canada. He explored a lot. And so he, in the far north, in the cold expanse of the Arctic, an explorer named Vilmarsta Hansen had a startling discovery on the diet of the Inuits he lived with. So what had happened is one of his explorations fell apart. The ship got pinched by the ice, eventually was crushed, and a small portion of his group went out to hunt for their own food, ended up living with the Inuits for a period of two years. So that's me paraphrasing that story. And in those two years, he had nothing but fat and meat. And so you can think of what their diet was. There was no veggies at all, ever. And that's pretty interesting. So it started with him. And what happened was that he came back after his exploring days were over and said, you know, veggies are not, and carbs are not necessary. And it was such an outrage that they said, prove it. So they had him agree to a long-term one year, we're going to watch everything that you eat. So it started off in the hospital and he was given nothing but meat and fat, 
meat and fat. And after a while, the agreement was, well, just come in and get monitored so we can see you eat and we'll do your tests. And then it was just come in to get tested. And it actually lasted for two years and they wrote research on this. But the findings were published in July 3rd, 1926. Uh, the effects of an exclusive long continued meat diet. So it's 1926. So any anytime people say, oh, the protein diet can't be done or whatever, it, this is where I'm starting is with this particular study about um, Mr. Stefanson, since I can't pronounce his first name. Okay. And so what were the results? The committee had failed to find even one trace of evidence of all the supposed harmful effects of the diet. Isn't that amazing? This is after two years of study. So they published it and you can go back and you can get this online still. So it's the effects of an exclusive long-term continued meat diet based on the history and experiences of clinical survey of the Vihimar Stefansson Arctic Explorer. And there's the link. So then it moved to, uh, Mrs. Stefansson died in the early 60s up in Dartmouth, by the, well, in Hanover, not so much at Dartmouth. And so now in 1961, a physician wrote this book called Strong Medicine, which was advocating basically an entirely whole food source protein diet. So you had the fat that came with a meat diet, a fish diet, uh, poultry, what we're talking about when we talk about protein sparing fast. Lean meats, not always lean meats. And so he wrote a number of versions of this, and you can actually get this book uh, uh, if you want to, but you can certainly find the photocopies, the um, scanned copy of the entire book here. So it came out in 1961. Okay then, so we went from 26, the publish publication came out in 26, that's 30, uh, 25 years later, and um, this was a moderate success. It wasn't a runaway. Now you have to remember, in the 60s, we just came through the 50s, obviously, and the sitting president of Eisenhower, who was kind of the hero of World War II, for sure, D-Day and all that, that he had had three or four heart attacks as a sitting president in the United States, and so they're all worried about heart disease. So in this time, you had the beginning of the whole no fat, saturated fats were bad, and that was by Ansel Keys. And so this whole anti-fat thing started from the late 50s and extended all the way up until pretty much the present time. People are still, th and it was, in my words, uh, bogus. That was a cherry-picked study, and it's a whole different presentation that is done very well in a number of other uh, YouTubes that you could look for. And I'll give you my synopsis later. But that was the alternative. So anybody who was talking about protein and fat was kind of pushed back. So then in 1976, now we're 15 years later, this came out, Last Chance Diet. How's that for a catchy title? So this was a Dr. Robert Lynn who basically was saying, hey, it's a protein diet, just have protein. It was for weight loss, it was for obesity. And um, so he did this, but the problem was he came up with a special product, right? He was product oriented and it was a collagen based product. And that's not the weak link here, that's not the problem, but it's a partial problem. He found that he could get a good source of collagen from slaughterhouses. And what happened, he made this into a, a drink, he made this into a product that became very, very popular. We're talking millions of products were sold, and this was a big rage. And it was people who were just gonna have this collagen drink for a couple days, a couple weeks, and went on and on. People went to the hospital and over 60 people were documented to have died because they did this. So you go, oh my gosh, I'm not doing that anymore. Well, this was collagen. So collagen is not a, it uh, doesn't cover all the essential amino acids for one. It's not a whole food source, so to say. It's a processed food. And let me read to the bottom. It's, it was an estimated 2 million people tried this diet and reportedly 60 people died while following it. Uh, the drink lacked complete protein, meaning it didn't contain all nine essential amino acids. This created severe tissue loss in muscles and vital organs such as the heart. Oops. Okay, it was popularized by the book, and it was, it was the big deal, let me tell you. Hailed as a breakthrough, this is from the New York Times, hailed as a breakthrough in fighting obesity, the liquid protein diet, which is what it was called, 
in which several tablespoons of the product was taken with little or no other food was popularized by Robert Lynn of Pennsylvania, an osteopath, starting to give alternative medicine a bad name, don't you think? The Last Chance Diet, but a great title. He certainly had an eye. So with the stimulus, with this stimulus, an estimated 4 million people in the United States and Canada began buying the product. In two years, liquid protein, which was originally developed a decade ago to feed chronically ill patients, grew into a $40 million business. This is 1976. There are now nearly 200 makers, so it flourished, um, of this liquid protein. With an initial investment of 100,000, dozens of companies rushed into the business. Prices of the dark, syrupy liquid climbed to $8 a pint, enough for about three days, about $14.50 for a quart. Amazing. The liquid protein diet controversy. Now, 1977. Then it goes on, 1978, the liquid protein turmoil intensifies. Okay, most of the supplements in demand today are enzyme hydrolyzed, uh, hydrolyzed collagen taken from fibrous protein collagen that is found in a variety of animal tissues and then converted into laboratory to a vaguely gelatinous liquid. Most labels specify that the product is a pre-digested and unappetizing term that means the first step of digestion process, partly separating the protein into its amino acids, is conducted outside the body. Um, it goes on, this is, as I say, I'm reading from the New York Times of that day. So I wanna say, speaking of collagen, collagen is tryptophan deficient. So what about it? Which is an essential amino acid. If this is your only source of protein, you will become serotonin deficient, you will become uh, melatonin deficient, but glycine is in abundance in collagen and bone broth. So what does that mean? So the reason I bring this up is because collagen is all the craze now, right? There's a thousand, and I'll probably do a, a video on YouTube about showing you how bogus a lot of the products are that both you and I have heard about, but that's another time. But the fact that it is incomplete in that being tryptophan deficient is going to set you off to eventually be very depressed and possibly even a little crazy. When you get tryptophan deficient, when you can't even sleep at night and you get serotonin deficient, let me say all hell will break loose sooner than later. So it's also deficient in essential amino acids, methionine, and it will lead to non-alcoholic fatty liver disease or your liver breakdown. Not a good thing. Methionine is abundant in meat, fish, poultry. Uh, you need it to have a balance with glycine. So basically, if you are gonna have collagen, you need to balance it with real food sources of meat, which are your meat, all your meats, your meat, your, your lamb, your pork, uh, whatever, or game, uh, fish, and your poultry. Okay, so that's the deal on that. So in 1996, so now we are 20 years later to the day, to the year, um, Michael and Mary Eads came out with this book, Protein Power. They're there in, at the time in Arkansas, and they actually knew the Clintons. Um, this had its own following, which is part of now the low carb movement. So it began, it began low carb, and which low carb movement was part of the whole ketogenic movement, which I haven't talked about here. We talked about it in another place. And um, this was really growing in a lot of uh, popularity. So the protein power, it went, it went nuts in 1976. So recommended post-bariatric surgery. So people who go in to have bariatric surgery for weight loss, the one thing they have to have is a protein drink. It's not the collagen protein drink. It's a protein drink because it is so essential. You can't be without protein. You can be without carbs, and you can be kind of skimpy on fats, but you need to have some essential fats. But protein, absolutely, you cannot do without. So however, there's a reason long-term weight loss from bariatric surgery doesn't last. The point, whole food protein, use whole food protein when doing this for a complete source of amino acids, omega-3 minerals and vitamins. That's just how to stay safe. So when I talk about my approach, it's absolutely about whole food sources of protein. There's not this liability. Some people are going to go, I'm gonna go do a 
collagen drink and I'm going to do it for a couple of weeks and they're going to get sick. And then they're going to come back and say, I did this protein sparing modified fast because I saw some YouTube video and they're going to get themselves very sick. That's unfortunate because I think the truth of having protein, whole food sources of protein as being your main diet, if not your entire diet, um, will be fine. As you know, the caveat is, and we'll get into it in a second, you need to have organ meats, egg yolks, and liver to complete everything. Even just muscle meat, as we've discussed before, is insufficient, not in terms of amino acid, but in terms of other nutrients, fatty sol fat soluble nutrients primarily. Okay, so make no mistake, long-term protein sparing modified fat will create deficiencies, both macro and micronutrient deficiencies. Once your body fat has normalized, you will need to pay attention to your essential fatty acids. So clearly, most people who are watching this video right now, I can tell you that they are uh, probably 85% women that are over the age of 40 to um, 65 to 70. The rest are men, they're pretty much the same age brackets, and their number one concern, for the most part, is weight, fat loss. Weight loss, but fat loss. And then there's a minority that is interested about muscle hypertrophy, which is really the healthier way of looking at this. So, eventually you have to include, uh, consider including a multivitamin, uh, include organ meats, collagen perhaps, and eggs to fulfill your macronutrient requirements of doing this long term. So look at the micronutrients of protein. So if you were just to have meat, chicken, fish, and egg whites, you'd get a lot. You absolutely get a lot, but you are, you're going to be deficient in a good uh, seven or eight particular. I get to list them off, but you can do a screenshot and read them off yourself. So there's obviously room for improvement. If you want to do this long term, and so how my wife and myself do it, Judy, is that we have three or four days of what we call PSMF, and then What's the difference on the weekends or the remaining three days? Yes, we can have fat, but it will then be, that's where the liver comes in. That's where the egg yolk comes in. And we have a lot of egg yolks, a lot of egg yolks, because we make a thing called protein bread, which you'll see in a second. So just add liver and egg yolks. Liver has B12, B2, B12. Really what you're looking at is uh, B12 and folate, and yes, some vitamin A. Those three are top of the line. If you get behind on B12 and folate, you're done. That You're going towards depth. There's no other side roads to take. So you really got to pay attention to it. Don't be too clever. And then there's egg yolks, which also add to that in areas that um, liver is good at. Liver is the most nutritious food you could have, by the way, to get that out. Uh, and eggs are pretty much the second most nutritious. When you eat a protein, make sure to eat enough to maximize the benefit. So we've talked about this before. You really, you know, you do one gram of protein per pound of body weight, which equals 2.2 grams of protein per kilogram of ideal body weight, okay? So ideally you wanna break it up into four servings. So you get that calculation. Let's say you're a woman of 5'4". Okay, your ideal body weight is 135, means 135 grams of protein. What are you gonna do? Well, break it up. Let's say 135 divided by four is um, 18, nine, um, well, there you go. About 25 grams, 24, 25 grams per snack. And then you go, well, what does that look like? We've talked about that in other videos and you do have to measure things initially, get out your scale, figure it out, whether it's breast of meat, some steak, um, fish or chicken, you know, figure that out just once, just once and you're done. You go, you know, a chicken doesn't grow. It doesn't like, oh, I forgot what it looks like from the day before. You know what it looks like, <laughs> you know, done. You did that part. Okay. All right. Why protein is very different than fat and carbs. Three concepts about protein you probably never knew. One is, so now we're using the donut as, as carbs. We're using a, um, avocado is fat, and then we're using the turkey leg as protein. So what's the difference? It's the cost of digestion. So that is, they call it the thermic effect of food. 
that you have to burn up so many calories just in the digesting. Fat is almost calorie free. So what they did for what we're doing here is 200 calories of each macro. You will need to burn up about 60 calories if you're eating protein. So you have fewer calories, fewer net calories. Six calories if you're eating fat. So you have a lot of net calories. Pretty much they're all there. And for carbs, a little more, but pretty much. So that's one thing. The thermic effect of food means you use more calories in digesting it and therefore burning it up. So we lose 35% calories uh, of the calories consumed in metabolizing protein compared to fat or carbohydrates, to put it in a different, different context. It also is very satiating. You find that the more protein you eat is much more satiating. That's part of it. Okay, so how do you maximize satisfaction, satiety? Um, on a protein sparing modified fast. Well, what happens as the percentage of your diet increases with protein, you feel full sooner. And so it's interesting, the people who overeat, overeat when they don't have enough protein, right? So they, or you can say they have low protein in their diet and allows them to overeat more carbs and more fats. And so when you start building up protein first, have your protein first, well, there's not much room for other things. And in fact, you never get to 100% of your diet. This is your percent of your calories. So you're going to pretty much stop eating around 50%. So when we calculate your proteins that we've done on previous videos, that is the comfortable amount that you should have for metabolic needs. And uh, that's far lower than 100%. So you will feel satiated earlier. Um, consequently, you won't be having the carbs and the fats. And so when you plan out your protein sparing modified fast and said, this is how much I should be having and put it into four servings, there you go. You got something to do four times a day, even if it's just the right size hamburger or the right size chicken breast. You'll know and it's pretty straightforward. You might get bored, but the nice thing is, yes, you might get bored, but if you're feeling full, that's a whole different then you're just bored and you can find something else to do with your time. If you're hungry, unlike fasting in which you're hungry for the most part, then it changes, of course, that you're both hungry and you have nothing to do. That's a whole different context. So, okay, so this is just comparing very low carbohydrate diet. And the other thing about protein sparing modified fast, it just showed you that you get satiated a lot earlier. Well, really most people just have about 800 calories per day. No, it's not on a per person basis. It, you know, it, it, it varies, but that's the running average. So that's a big difference because on the average, people need 1,600 to 2,000. You know, it's the back of those labels, it's all based on 2,000 calories. So that's a far cry. That's where you're going to be having a caloric deficit, which is where the fat loss happens. But you're feeling satiated while you're doing this. And then if you feel you're losing too much fat, then you obviously start adding more fat back into your diet, have more uh, fattier cuts of meat or fish or whatever it is you're doing, okay? Have no doubt a protein sparing modified fast is a fast. It is a temporary shock to your metabolism. So the shock to your metabolism is what, no carbs? Suddenly it has to switch from glucose to fat burning. And that is a shock. And protein, you can say, well, protein supplies both. Yeah, that's why protein is such a perfect food. It can be, uh, make the rounds go to gluconeogenesis, we'll get to in a second. And it obviously it's about protein for use and it carries some fat if you're using a whole food source of protein. Most proteins can be used by the liver to create more glucose, but not all. Gluconeogenesis, let's go into that. So what you have are different collections of amino acids, right? So you have arguably 21 amino acids, eight essential, possibly nine, depending what you think of glutamine. So you have what they call glucogenic. That is, these can be used as a precursor um, in, the, in helping the liver make glucose. So those are glucogenic. And you have some that are ketogenic. They can help make ketones, leucine and lysine. And then you have some that are both. So by the way, when you talk about protein, uh, branch chain amino acids, branch chain amino acids are leucine, 
isoleucine, uh, sorry, I, uh, leucine, isoleucine, valine right here. And there you go. Comments from the challenge. So what we did uh, about a year and a half ago, we basically opened it up and we had free coaching, collective group coaching for this particular challenge. And there, we did say, hey, it'd be great if you break up your protein, but we didn't make a big deal about it. It's just, you know, just have lean sources of protein for this week, let it be that. And I wasn't going to get too deep into 50 people's lives or 100 people's lives for this particular week. But they sent me back their experiences afterwards and we talked about it had a follow-up, a mass follow-up, a Zoom meeting. Okay, so regarding, regarding tracking glucose, ketones, weight, etc. Here's from one person's recording. Um, this is just three days, three days in May, right? So that person lost some weight. Uh, it says body fat. This is all arguable. If they're going by at-home scales, at-home scales are notoriously terrible. So I doubt this person's going for a DEXA. Uh, or a bod pod, but according to that, they uh, they lost fat. But what's interesting here, I find, and this is pretty much unequivocal, is their GKI, glucose ketone index. So here's the ratio, um, glucose ketone index, but here is the ketones. So the ketones went up, and of course, the, and here's the blood glucose. So that's pretty cool. So she took her glucometer readings, she took her ketometer readings, and she formulated the GKI. Um, pretty interesting. What a great way to do it. What else? Okay, this is somebody else saying in three days, they dropped four pounds. Okay, here's another person who didn't have such a great experience. And the reason I put this here is that suddenly they had explosive poops <laughs> afterwards. Well, a lot depends on where you start. You know, are you starting, you're already fat adapted, are you starting, you've already been a ketogenic diet for six months or a year and you're clearly fat adapted and uh, accommodating that? Or are you going from a pretty high carb and you think this is going to be the panacea and three days a week for a month and you're going to be whatever it is you want to be? That's too much of a change. You got to take baby steps and make that transition. Um, that's what I find. So if somebody's coming from a fairly high carb, high carb or normal carb diet as we see it in the United States and certainly in parts of Europe, like in Germany, um, it's going to be hard to make that shift right away. So take steps. And so I thought that was a good, good post. Um, she says, her glucose went up. Of course, this is a person that she used her Keto Mojo, which is a ketometer and a glucometer. It says her glucose is usually around 60 to 70 and so went up to 100. This is a person who's generally pretty heavy. And what they found is that for them, the protein actually did is a transitionary period in which you do have slightly elevated blood glucose levels and then it drops down. Your body is trying to figure out, what do I do with this? The, the, the muscle doesn't seem to want my glucose anymore. It's just having fat. Well, that's the point. So that was pretty interesting too. And, but this person lost 4.2 pounds. So here's the bread that Judy makes, which is basically made of egg whites. And um, it's not a secret recipe, but she does a great job. And now we have garlic bread and rosemary bread and uh, various kinds of bread that she makes. And we actually have this every every night for dinner, as what she calls a crumpet, crumpets. That's our dessert, but it's a protein bread. And there's her sardines. And so that's her lunch. And it's pretty high protein. Obviously, somebody's meal sent a picture is chicken breast. Before the picture of the protein bread, this is Judy's doing it. There's after the picture of the garlic rosemary. That's what I was thinking of, protein bread. And so what we also do, um, this is back at, from this particular group, we do hit twice a week at the gym, another day just working with weights, and then we do two or three days at home doing a video. And these are the two guys we follow, Fitness Blender and Funk Roberts for abs. There's somebody from the group showing what they had lost. That's pretty interesting. And said, here's somebody else said, I think I lost weight in my legs for the most part. Um, some positives, hunger relatively stable during the day, easy to adhere to, no crash after eating, stable energy throughout the day. Absolutely, some negatives. Night two and three, I woke up around four, go to the bathroom, uh, and it took a lot more than usually to get back to sleep. Very hungry in the morning, hungry. So it takes a transition. 
Food selection and taste were bland because when you're starting, you're, you're afraid you're gonna do something wrong. Once you start to know that it's really pretty liberal and you learn how to cook these things, not a problem. But these are the comments worth posting. Here's somebody else. I definitely prefer my coffee with heavy cream. <laughs> but uh, I can forgo nuts and other dairy. I do wonder about whether all the extra fats and oils are necessary, meaning that's what they were coming from. Every day she added all these fats. Um, on the four days of PSMF uh, might help to answer that. She needs to drop weight. Keto Mojo, those were numbers. Ketones went up, as I told you about. This person, oh, it's the same person. Um, they lost 500 grams, which is a, uh, a good, but they said their sleep was awful. That's making the transition. Somebody else lost a lot of weight. And um, here we go, what'd they lose? about, well, they only lost three or four pounds. A lot of people learned how to make this bread. Okay, there you go, another person down five pounds and somebody else trying to make all that bread. So the point of all this is this, you jump in and you try it, it's pretty basic, you can be really scientific, but one thing I wanna switch over to is this. When people ask about, so where did this eating multiple times a day of protein? Well, that information has been out there for a good 10, if not 15 years, but here's a good study that came out in 2018 that basically says that, probably should have highlighted it, that it was clear that the most efficient uh, use of protein was having four meals, uh, four meals a day, to eat a minimal of 1.6 grams per kilogram of ideal body weight um, up to a maximum of 2.2, which is what I told you about before. So, you know, this has been researched, done and redone, but it's out there. So it wasn't anybody just making it up. This wasn't somebody in the back of their garage coming up with an idea. This has been studied and they really get into it. It's a good study. I'll go to the top. It goes into um, whole foods versus protein powders versus whey. It's a good read. So... Till next time, I hope this was a shot in the arm and I hope this gave you a historical context so you feel comfortable with the protein sparing modified fast and there's a way to start it, but to incorporate it into your life, not as it's exceptional little two or three days and you're never gonna do it, do it again or, or this particular month. Till next time, take care.